So hello everybody for one more session of the Logica Universalis webinar. Today we'll have a session on uh, medieval logic with a paper by uh, Michael Karmansky at Mission Francaise and uh, the presentation of logic in Israel. I will give the floor to Ada Zamansky uh, with uh, today the chair of the session, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Janine, for the invitation. It is a great honor for me. Uh, today we have uh, two distinguished researchers presenting uh, this talk, uh, to whom I also have a, a personal connection, which I will share with you in a moment. But first, I am going to let uh, Liron Cohen, the representative of the Israeli logicians, say a few words on the research activities of logic in Israel. Liron, please. Thanks, Anna. Um, so yes, uh, thanks um, uh, for organizing this whole thing and also for inviting me. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, together with Anna to represent the, the Israeli logic community. Um, so um, just in a few words, I wanna tell you about uh, kind of uh, Israel's uh, history in logic. Um, and, and those, uh, the, the, uh, the roots of logic in Israel go back to the 1920s uh, when the math department at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem was founded. Um, so, so the first uh, head of the faculty of mathematics there was uh, Avraham Levi Frankel. Uh, and um, having been a logician, uh, he essentially formed in Jerusalem uh, kind of a world center for mathematical logic. Uh, so we had there um, uh, Azriel Levi, Saron Shelach, uh, Michael Rabin, Chaim Geifman, uh, Menachem Megiddo, and many, many others. And um, the work done in the center uh, kind of focused on the traditional aspects of logic. So uh, model theory, set theory, and uh, computability theory. And um, in fact, I found out that uh, the first uh, international congress for logic, methodology, and philosophy for science of science uh, was actually held there in Jerusalem back uh, in 1964. Um, and then other departments uh, were formed in Israel uh, that kind of um, broadened the scope of logic in Israel. So uh, we had, um, we still have, uh, so Dov Gabay, uh, Sarit Kraus, and Jonathan Stavi at Bar Ilan University uh, started working on non-classical and non-monotonic reasoning, and also uh, some proof theory. Uh, at the Weizmann Institute, we had uh, Amir Pnueli, who um, uh, worked on temporal logics, and David El, who developed dynamic logic. Um, and then at uh, Tel Aviv, uh, uh, in the math department, we had people uh, like uh, Joram Hirschfeld and Mati Gitek, uh, who worked on uh, set theory, um, but then uh, Boaz Drachtenbrot, uh, who worked on non-monotonic logics, uh, founded the computer science department and um, formed uh, the logic group that have people like um, uh, Nachum Darshovitz, Arnon Avron, uh, uh, Alex Rabinovich. Um, at the Technion, uh, Orna Grunberg, who works on model checking, and Jan Schmakowski on database theory, and of course our uh, two speakers uh, that Anna will be presenting in a minute. Uh, and so the list goes on and on. And, um, and nowadays uh, the Israeli contribution to logic is really divided um, mainly between uh, math researchers that practice the classical topics of mathematical logic and uh, computer science researchers uh, focusing on um, kind of all the new exciting applications of logic in computer science, 
working on solvers and programming languages uh, and such. So um, I hope I mentioned uh, most of the names I should have mentioned, but um, um, there are uh, surely many, many others. And uh, um, I, I think uh, logic has very strong roots here in Israel and has evolved since uh, to very exciting new research uh, by, by the kind of the, um, the new generation of logicians here in Israel. Uh, and so now um, we're going to listen to uh, two uh, eminent uh, Israeli logicians uh, uh, who Anna will be presenting, right? So uh, back to you, Anna. Thank you. Maybe there would be some question. Uh, I have some question about <laughs> what you say. But... Sure. Uh, what I would like to ask, if uh, as far as I know, that, uh, there are no regular uh, conference uh, on logic in Israel regarding all people working logic. I took part to an event organized by Anna uh, in 2012. It was for the 60 years of Arno Aron. And today, it's, uh, by the way, today it is the birthday of Arno Aron, so <laughs> that's why he's not here. But happy birthday to him. So Anna organized this. Uh, Nice event in, in 2012, and then she organized, I think, two of or one or two of her events. I took part in one of them. But it seems to me that there is no regular events. Uh, you can explain that. And do you plan to have this kind of uh, meeting? Like, for example, in Brazil, we have a Brazilian Brazil logical conference on a regular basis. So, so there is actually a, a, a logical event in Israel. I think, Anna, do you want to say something about Israel law? Um, yes, yes, Geneva mentioned that he uh, was was a guest here at one of the Israelogs, and we uh, hope to continue this tradition. But in the next year, we have this flock big event coming to Israel. So you could hardly say that Israel has no logic events. So we are working hard on hosting that event. And once that happens, we will have time to think of future events. I see that Jan Wolanski wants to <laughs> wants to ask a question. Please, yeah. Uh, you're muted. First Congress was not in Jerusalem, but in Stanford in 1960. In oh, really? It was Second Congress, yes. Okay, I stand corrected. I, I, I yes, thought. Yes. So the first was organized by Sapi Starsky, and just after. Uh, uh, this uh, international uh, about logic and philosophy of science was established. And also, I think that it should be fair to say about pioneers like Abraham Frankel and Yehoshua Bar Hillel, because they grounded logic in Jerusalem. I think that the university was founded in 1928, yes, or something like that. And so, so, so I think that we should give a credit to these people who were in a very hard conditions. And then was Edward Poznański, a student of Polish logicians who popularized mathematical logic and logic in Israel. He emigrated to Palestine in 1937, I guess, from, from Wuchar, from Warsaw. Okay, so. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Thank you. Any more questions or remarks? Thank you, everyone, for for these comments. So, Janif, can we proceed now? Sure, sure. Okay. So, thank you, Leron. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce two more Israeli logicians, eminent logicians, who have joined forces collaborating on a topic which I personally find very interesting uh, on calculi for many valued logics. I will first introduce uh, Nisim Frances 
uh, who uh, unfortunately is not here, so he will be represented by Mikhail Kaminsky. So Nisim is an emeritus professor of computer science at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. At a certain point of his career, he moved from research related to concurrent and distributed programming and program verification to research in computational linguistics, mainly formal semantics of natural language. In recent years, he has worked on proof theoretic semantics, in particular for natural language. More recently, he has worked also on non-classical logics, including connexive logic. And in fact, he has recently published the first ever monograph on the topic of connexive logic, a family of non-classical logics based on the intuition that a proposition cannot validly imply nor be implied by its own negation. And now on a personal note, Nisim was my supervisor in my master's studies focusing on natural logic. It was in his computational linguistics research period. He has been very inspirational for me in many ways. I was especially influenced by his passion for science, for not resting until we get it right in understanding a certain phenomenon and for remaining always modest and approachable to all of his students, despite his great fame in the field of formal methods. For being such a good teacher, I remain forever thankful to him. And our next speaker is Mikhail Kaminsky, who will also uh, represent them both. Uh, Mikhail is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Computer Science, also at the Technion. His research interests include non-classical logics in a broad sense of non-classical, automata theory, especially finite automata on infinite objects, and algebraic complexity, namely computations over finite fields. On a personal note, Professor Kaminsky was my lecturer in one of the first logic courses at the Technion. Uh, I remember that we studied using the classical Mendelssohn textbook. I remember struggling with the material, but thanks to Mikhail, I did not give up because I was genuinely intrigued by it. Mikhail challenged us students in a truly inspiring way. So I was lucky to have such inspiring teachers and it is a great honor for me to announce their collaboration on the topic of many valued logics. So Mikhail, the stage is yours. Thank you, Anna. Okay, let's go, just a moment. Uh, okay, here we are. Good, so just uh, the paper recently published in uh, Logic Universalis is Calculi for Many Valid Logics. And uh, just it's uh, mostly technical paper, just uh, I try to give some intuition and some examples, and uh, we'll see just when where we arrive. Uh, so just uh, this is the classical two-valued logic, and uh, where connectives are defined by the truth tables. Just everybody knows uh, this. We have two truth values, truth and falsity, and uh, this is uh, the definition of connectives. So each uh, connective is defined by truth table, which is a function. Uh, an appropriate function just by given by uh, the appropriate entry in the table. There is also another example is Klinis uh, three valued logics. Here we have three values, truth, falsity, and neutral, and uh, this is the natural order. Uh, this is uh, the table for negation. The table for conjunction just is the minimum for the junction is the maximum and the implication is defined by a standard in standard way just phi implies psi is not phi of psi just one can check this table this is also Lukasevich three valid logic where those connectives are the same and the implication is different then we have Milnap done four valid logic which defined like this this is the order of the truth values the negation is quite interesting, just the negation of uh, n and b, uh, n and b the same. Again, the conjunction is the minimum and the disjunction is the maximum. This uh, one can see this is the lattice. And then just also post n-valued logic. There are many others. 
where conjunctions and disjunctions are defined by the minimum and the maximum, and the negation is cyclic. We can see it just as a cyclic shift of those values. Okay, that's what we have. Okay, so this is quite a, quite an abstract approach. We have an LRA connective is defined semantically just uh, by the function of uh, uh, V to the L to the V, and the V is the set of n truth values. So we are dealing with n valued logics. And actually, the calculi in this paper just deal with labeled formulas, which are pairs phi k, where phi is a formula, and k is just an index for one pen, and the intuitive meaning of such a pair is that v sub k is the value associated with formula phi. So the calculus deals with sequence, which are four expressions of the form gamma arrow delta, gamma and delta finite possibly empty sets of labeled formulas. So this, the calcul is, I repeat, the calcul of labeled formulas. And just as the usual sequence, uh, gamma arrow delta is the, the conjunction of all labeled formulas in gamma implies the disjunctions of all labeled formulas in delta, where uh, the phi, this pair of IK has a just classical meta, meta value. This is true if the value of phi is V sub K. So what is the calculi? Ah, just, uh, there are many works on uh, such uh, labeled, uh, calculi of labeled formulas. The first is by Rosenau about 40 years ago, Takahashi same 40 years, uh, Hanazawa and Takana, something 35, and uh, just Bas, Femula, and Zach, at last is 1993. And there's also another approach of uh, Anne and uh, Arnon and Ron to non-deterministic uh, multivariate logic, which is not here, but uh, all those papers dealt with sets of formulas delta, whose intuitive meaning is just the disjunction of the formulas in delta. So this means that delta corresponds to our sequence with the, the empty antecedent. And we shall call such sequence simple. This is, and later on I will show just a more detailed correspondence between our approach and all these approaches and how all this can be expressed uh, in our formalism and vice versa, how our formalism can be expressed in any of those. Okay, what are the axioms? So this is quite a classical axiom that each labeled formula implies itself. And also for each entry, VK1, VKL, such that whose value is VK, we have such an axiom. So if the value of phi one is K one and so on, the value of phi L is KL, it implies that the value star of phi one phi L is K. This is the other axioms. And uh, also we have many, many structural rules of inference, just which I list in a moment, but let's see how does it work in our classical case. So this is a table for, of implication. So in the case of implication, we have four axioms. So we see here F and F, what is F and F implies T. So if phi one, if the value is F, say uh, V1 and here F1, so we have Y phi implies Y2, the value is T and so on. So there are four axioms corresponding to this uh, truth table. And so on thus, if in truth table we have, I don't know, many entries and we have many, many corresponding uh, axioms, and I will not calculate how many. Okay, negation. This is the truth table, and to this table corresponds correspond to those axioms. If phi is false, then not phi is true, and if phi is true, then not phi is false. Just everybody knows we go pretty fast because I have many, many slides to cover.
Okay, so rules of inference. So if you think of our sequence in classical case, so in, in the classical logic, just we would move this formula from the antecedent to succeed, but put in the negation. What does it mean? Not the value of phi is k. That means that value of phi can, keep, can be any other value but k. So it goes to all pairs where the first component is phi and the other component is not k. So from one to n, to n but not k. And uh, this is L shift. We, we shift formula from the succeeding from the antecedent to the succeeding. And conversely, so when we shift the formula backwards from the succeeding to the antecedent, if you put here not, it could be any uh, value, but not k prime. So this is k double prime, which is not k prime. And here it should be disjunct, but we ha don't have classical disjunction. So all those sequence, just uh, sequence are equivalent to gamma with the disjunction of all those phi uh, comma k double prime in the antecedent. We have classical weakening of the antecedent. We have classical weakening of the succeeding. We have cut the classical cut. And we have a resolution just which uh, is just one. So if k prime differs from uh, k double prime, just it's eliminated by the resolution. So in the classical logic, we have k say phi, and here we have not phi. This is resolution, but not phi is phi t, not phi is phi false, f is not equal to t, and then we uh, are left with such a situation. But actually, cut and the resolutions are derivable from each other, but uh, they are using them both are very convenient for uh, just from a technical point of view. So we can see that the resolution uh, is derivable by cut. So we have to those premises of by resolution. Here we make R shift shifting this labeled formula to the antecedent with the same k, k prime, apply cut, and we are get uh, just the resolution. And the converse uh, derivation is also, is, is a bit longer and just, it can be found in the papers, not too complicated. Okay, now, what about this secret? So we take this axiom and using L shift, we, we move this pair to the succeeding, then we obtain all indices but k. And here we have k, so we have all here, all pairs like this, f phi comma i, and actually those are axioms of uh, the Bas, Vermeuler, and Zach paper. And this is done by k, uh, L shift. Okay, another example is if uh, k prime and k dou prime are different, then this sequence is derivable. So we start with this axiom and move this to the antecedent by R shift. And then just if gamma does not derive delta, then for no formula phi and no k prime, k double prime, this is in gamma. Why? If this is in gamma, then we start with this. Using weakenings, we L weakenings, we obtain here gamma, and using R weakenings, we obtain here delta. So just uh, I will remind this corollary in a moment. Okay. Also, sequence, this is our sequence. This is the sequence in all papers I mentioned, I think, on slide eight. So they're derivable each from the other by shifts. So to obtain this sequence from this, just, just move gamma to the succeeding by L shifts and going back, we move all these formulas back to by the R shifts. So the, the calculi are more or less the same, but those sequences are 
much more convenient for technical reason uh, for dealing with. Okay. So we also need derivable law of, law of inference. Uh, I'm not sure whether I will arrive at this point, but this KL multi shift. So if you have many premises like this, uh, then we can move all those phi case, phi case to the succeeding, just replacing here K by its complement. If you remember L shift, you have only K is one element set. Okay, one element set, if you write here the complement of K, everything but K, lowercase K, and here we have the complement to the uppercase, to the capital K. Okay, so far, semantics. What does it mean that evaluation satisfies a secret? Evaluation is just an assignment of values to the propositional variables, and then it extends to formulas uh, by means of the truth tables. This means, as we see, just if for each labeled formula gamma, the value of phi is vk, then for some labeled formula in delta, also the value of phi is vk. Okay, in other words, so the sequent uh, v satisfies a sequent gamma arrow delta if the meta value of this classical meta sequence is true. So here just this says that the value of phi is k for all labeled formulas in gamma, and this is for some labeled formula in gamma. And finally, just one more, excuse me, uh, definition that a sequent set of sequence sigma semantically entails a sequent sigma. This is a bold sigma and this is a regular sigma. This each, each relation satisfying all sequence and sigma also satisfies this sigma. And this is the completeness and soundness theorem. Then this bold sigma proves the sequence sigma. If and don't leave, it semantically entails sigma. And I'm going just slow down and prove this theorem. And just uh, this weighs uh, soundness. It's easy to verify, and we'll, I will prove the completeness only. That's proof of the same completeness. So the proof is actually the a modification of the Hankin proof in the classical logic. Uh, so uh, there is a maximal set of uh, labeled formulas, bold gamma, such that for no finite subset, gamma prime, gamma prime uh, arrow delta is not derivable. Just, uh, I don't know, but it follows by Zorn's lemma or something like this. Now, if you take this gamma, then for each formula phi, there is a value such that uh, the pair phi k is in gamma. If this is not so, then for each phi k, this will be derivable. We have this, and we have derivable sequence, this one from one of our examples. And by n cuts, just we arrive to gamma arrow delta, but this is not derivable. And so just so for each phi, we have a corresponding value. Good, so far. Now, if you have here, like in the Hankin proof, we can define the valuation on the set of oppositional variables. So uh, the value of P is VK, if and only if this pair, K is the label of P is in gamma. And we saw about the above observation, it's well-defined because this is not empty. And also just it's well defined because it cannot be so that both VK prime and VK double prime are the values of P. Otherwise, this would be derivable because this pair derives the empty sequence and then we arrive to gamma and delta by weakenings. Okay, 
So we have defined the variation. And now, just the classical uh, uh, canonical model theorem that the value of phi is VK if and only if this pair is in gamma. This is short. The proof is by induction the complexity of phi. The basis is immediate, just the definition, and the induction by for induction step, we assume that this is phi is in this form. And we assume, assume that phi k is in gamma, and we have to prove, prove that the value of phi is v sub k, and assume that this is not the value sum k prime, such that k prime differs from k. And let the values of subformulas phi 1, phi l, be phi kj. So the value of phi j is v k j. And then by the induction hypothesis, all those are in gamma. Then from the table axiom, wow. What is the table axiom? The table axiom says that this arrow star of those uh, comma k, we have this. Why? Because phi is this. This arrow, this is the table axiom. I wrote it like this. And then by weakness, we add here gamma and here we delta. And we also have this axiom, k prime differs from k. We can apply resolution. And after resolution, this disappears, but this goes to the antecedent and we have this. But all this is also in gamma. I just wrote here to emphasize uh, those uh, labeled formulas, but all of them are in gamma. And so we see that gamma uh, implies delta, and this is not solved by our, by our assumption, and this is contradicts the definition of gamma. This is one way. The other way is immediate. So if the value is VK, but this formula is in gamma, K prime differs from K, but then by this part of the induction step, the value should be this in contradiction with this. Okay. No. So this is the canonical model. Theory. Now with the proof of the completeness theorem. So the first step is that uh, to prove that the pair is in delta, then for no, uh, sorry, uh, that for no label formula in delta, the value of phi is BK. So if for some phi k in delta, the value is k, we start this from this axiom by number of weakness, we obtain this, and this is in gamma. And then we uh, see that gamma implies delta, which is not so. Okay, what is left? We have to show that each sequent in sigma is satisfied by this relation. So let uh, gamma prime, arrow delta prime be such a sequent, be satisfied, satisfied by delta. So this means that we satisfy each labeled formula in gamma prime. And, satis and this, is, this means that gamma prime is a subset of gamma. And we have shown that it also satisfies some formula in delta prime. This means that the intersection is not empty by the definition of gamma. So if this is empty, uh, let us take a formula in delta prime and let its value be V k sub phi. The k sub phi is not equal to k because this is not here. And this is in gamma because this is the value. Then from this, by our shifts, we moved all formulas from delta to the, to the antecedent. And since the k here differs from k phi, we can move them to k phi. We have this. 
and all those formulas are in gamma. And this is in gamma also. We have all this in gamma, but this contradicts the definition of gamma. And that's all. So this is a completeness theorem. I run very fast because I want to show us the calculi for which this semantics is sound and complete. And those calculi are quite interesting. We have many, many dualities there and many kinds of dualities. So the first step is to replace the axioms with the rules of inference. Those were our axioms. And we replace this axiom with this rule of inference. So if we have all those premises, then we can derive, uh, uh, okay, we can derive this. Uh, what happens is that this calculi, and we have all other structures, just the only uh, action we replace is this action with this rule of inference. So we have cut elimination here, and uh, we can also restrict phi in our axioms in the form, uh, simple axioms in the form, just let me show, I didn't write it here. We can restrict phi here to the atomic formula, and this does not reduce uh, the, the power of this logic. So cut elimination in this. We have duality here. We have this axiom. What does it mean metasemantically? This means that for one of the values phi i sub k, all this is satisfied. This is exactly one of the entries for which we have the star. And we have must have one of those entries. This means uh, this defines this star. This for one valuation, for one uh, say, okay, values vki, we have all those formulas. Then we have the corresponding entry here. Just let me show it in the next slide, that's what we have. And then we define this, uh, uh, say, the source of these formulas. There are all L tuples which define uh, the connective with the value vk. And we enumerate them like this. Assume that we have s tuples and they're like this from one to s. So this means that uh, the source of this formula theta one up to theta s, where theta s are this, and we have the axiom uh, here put an arrow and get a uh, uh, star uh, comma k. So we have this axiom. All this axiom, so all the <coughs> antecedents of the axioms are here in the theta q, and we have as such axioms. So we have this. We here we just replace it with our indexed formulas. We have this. And now here we have the disjunction of conjunctions. And we use distributivity, we have the conjunction of disjunctions of formulas of such a form, just I'll show it in a moment in the next slide, where this comes from each theta, each theta q contributes exactly one pair, exactly one pair like this. So the disjunction of theta q is a set of those pairs such that for each q we have exactly one pair inside. Just it can be seen like this. So this is our set of skews, and we can see them like this. And all those are premises of our uh, axioms. But now what are in this junction? In this junction we go top down, and from each row, uh, we choose only one labeled formula, and all these ways gave, the, gave us uh, this uh, disjunction. Wow. But what happens? We have a distributively dual axiom. 
So this is our original axiom and the distinguished dual axiom is like this. The, now the star moves into the antecedent and here for all sets of formulas in this disjunction, we have such a secret. And again, here we have just uh, the semantics is also sound and complete for this calculus. What is done just the structural rules are the same. They do not change, but this axiom is replaced with this one. Going down. Wow. What's here? And here we have the dual rule of inference. So this was our original rule of inference. But from here, if we have all this, we can derive it for all lambdas in this disjunction, then we can derive this secret. And again, we have cut elimination here. Now we have secretly dual rules of inference. Uh, what uh, was before the uh, disjunctive, was disjunctive duality and here we have secret uh, duality. So uh, before we have introduction into the succeeding and here we have introduction to the antecedent. So instead of we replace this rule with this rule, if we can derive it for all uh, tuples k1 kl which uh, give us value vk uh, then we have this secret it, again this is sound and complete the semantics sound and complete and again we have cut elimination here wow. what else now distributively secretly dual rules of inference here we have introduction into the antecedent. Previously, we saw introduction. Uh, this axiom uh, was uh, the, uh, it was an axiom and we replace it with introduction to the antecedent like this. If we can replace it for each delta, but for each lambda, we have these premises, then we can derive this. And again, we have cut elimination here. So it's just many, many equivalent approaches and uh, everybody can choose. Uh, it's his favorite. Uh, this is Nisim's favorite natural deduction because his proof of theoretical semantics. And actually what was presented in Israelog four years ago was calculating, uh, was natural deduction calculus, but then many other calculus uh, came out and for Anna it's uh, very unfortunate but it looks that the duality does not extend to no, uh, to n matrices the original axiomatization extends uh, the first rule of inference extends completeness theorem everything but dualities do not what can I do it's a complicated world but at least something so if we have this introduction, then we also have elimination rules, which are naturally like this. Those are elimination rules. So if we can derive it for all possible tuples of values, then we can eliminate uh, the star from the succeeding. And we also have the dual one. So uh, this is our axiom. And the duality, we have this for each lambda. If we have this, then we have an elimination like this. So just there are, I, I cannot think of uh, another reasonable uh, uh, calculi. Just we have sequent calculi, uh, we have a natural deduction, we have uh, some Hilbert style, and with all possibilities, with uh, dual and everything. And if uh, anyone can think of uh, in, another possibility, I'll be glad to hear and just uh, try to extend it also to, to this calculus. Okay, just I run, I run very fast, but it's all calculi I have and thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Just, just a moment. Where is it? Stop sharing. And here we are. Good. Yes. So, of course, my first question is uh, that I was very interested to see how this extends to non-deterministic logics. And you, you say you have already checked and the completeness. And I promised you by the end of this month, you'll see something. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So it's interesting that duality does not work. I was wondering, no, I think. The problem is I can, uh, okay, this may be only fun, but the same value K can appear in different entries. And uh, this spoils the set of tuples which provide the entry. So mm -hmm. we can use the mm -hmm. duality. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think uh, um, in your slide uh, 23, you said that we can replace any formula with an atomic one. So yes. is, is there the place where, uh, where there no, is no, a no, it's no. Also, no, the place is, this is a general, I tried, no, it's not the place. The place is just uh, the semantic spots because we can have two different entries of the N matrices which give us the same value of phi. Yeah. And it just uh, this spoils the tuples, the set mm -hmm. of the, yeah. the set of tuples. Yes, yes. With non-determinism, it, it's always uglier and more complex. No, but <laughs> it's nice. just we'll meet just when I'll send you just. Yeah, that, that, that's great. So maybe maybe other uh, others have questions. Yeah. I think I have enough time to repeat uh, all the talk now. <laughs> yes, and to go into more details. More no details, but uh, yes, please, yes, yes, Jan. Uh, I, 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 one is distinguished value, yes? No, there are no distinguished values. I and I did not talk about this, but there is a theorem in distinguished values. Let me put like this. In, if all values in sigma uh, in gamma are distinguished and we can derive them then all values in delta are also distinguished. Just okay. we can play with this. It can be played, but there are no distinguished values here. Okay. It changes uh, from, yes, there are no distinguished values. I forgot to tell this, yes, sorry. Because in all the logics I, I mentioned in the introduction, there are distinguished values. Say in uh, Keynes logic, this is T, and in Lukasiewicz uh, T and in, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, but there are logics with many distinguished values. Yes, 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 yes. This is a build up done logic and yes, yes. Yeah, last, sorry, 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 sorry. In cleanest logic is N and T, right, N and T, right, sorry. But if all, if all the values in gamma are distinguished and we can derive something, then all values in delta are also distinguished. Just, it follows from the semantics. You can prove it semantic. So your idea to not consider distinguished values, it's an original idea, I mean, because I have never heard of that before. For, it's for generalization, I guess. This is, no, as I told, this is not precisely uh, the uh, many value logic in the strict sense. It's calculated for labeled formulas. Just this, it's much more convenient because we have here, we are on a meta level. We can see the values in this count mm -hmm. just when we do this. So just, and then the distinguished values come explicitly just when we do them. Just if you understood you correctly. And what about this uh, question of introducing a label? Because also, uh, is it also original from your work to have a label? Uh, no, no, labels were introduced as I mentioned just many 40 years ago by Rosenau. And there are a number of works on this, yes. Oh, I see. No, just, they were not labels, but eventually they became labels. Uh, just uh, the more convenient representation. But, uh, and actually in the paper, which appeared in uh, Israelog 3, just there are no labels. They were numbered compartments which contained uh, formulas, but uh, it's, it's the same. But there are not so many people using this uh, this label nowadays. I hope they will. If no, just uh, nobody will publish our papers anymore. So what can I do? <laughs> no, I, no I, I still hope that uh, uh, non-deterministic matrices will appear somewhere after I proofs it, yes. <laughs> 
Uh, Michael, I think also Martin has a question. Yeah. Uh, where? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, your your label formulas um, re reminds me the the signed formulas of Abram. Uh, Arnon Abram gave a, a method for um, obtaining a sequence calculus for for matrix logics and. Um, um, he he it, it start with a, 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 with the calculus of signal formulas and then he, he translated it to 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 a start, to an ordinary calculus of two sided sequence. Uh, is there a way to translate your sequence in in an ordinary sequence? This is my first question, and the second oh. question is uh, usually with uh, with the. Uh, very natural and very easy. The other way, I don't believe it. So it's, I, I don't know. In this way, you would uh, get a, a very good uh, sequence calculus for any uh, many valued logic. I, I don't believe this is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I may make a remark, Martin, I think that uh, there is a condition for this translation. So the, the logic needs to satisfy a certain expressivity yes, condition. Yes. So not in, it does not work for sufficiently every- Sufficiently expressive. The language yeah. has to be, yes. I think that uh, this method is more general. Yeah. And the, my, my other question is my, uh, is uh, I think that if you have uh, many through values, you will have a very huge sequence calculus. Yes. 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 Is there a oh, way to decidable. reduce? No, this is decidable because we have cut elimination there. Uh, the procedure with cut elimination, I don't know, it's usually double exponential. It's just, no, just uh, everything is uh, very difficult from a computational point of view. Okay. And, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? That's an interesting discussion. Yes. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we would like to thank you for this talk and we hope that we have another webinar where we hear the second part on non-determinism. Johnny <laughs> publishes my papers. I just yeah. thank you all for just attending my talk. Okay, thank you. Great to continue. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Jerome, and thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody. So uh, it was a very nice session today. And uh, we will have the second session of the month because we have two sessions per month of the Logic Universal webinar next week uh, with some colleagues from uh, Russia. And this will be a talk uh, typically uh, on the universal logic spirits, correspondence analysis of some fragment of classical pop logic. So everybody is welcome. It will be next Wednesday at the same time.